let's get it started. Turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses four through nine. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses four through nine. It says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything but everything in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard. Somebody say guard. Will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren and sisters, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, And if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace. Yes, he'll be with you. I want to talk to you about today from this text. Lord, I need some peace. Lord, I need some peace. Let's go before the God of heaven in prayer. Father. We take a deep breath and we exhale. And we do that because in you we live and move and have our being, God. And I just pray in Jesus' name that you would penetrate our hearts, penetrate us with truth about who you are and who we are, particularly in this crisis we're in. And Lord God, give your people, give people an affirmation that you got us. Um, Lord God, help us to grab a hold to you like never before. Not distance ourselves from you, but you said if we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen, amen, amen. Lord, I need some peace. My mom's uh, growing up, uh, it was a lot of us. It was a lot of us. I have, it's nine of us, but only a few of us were in the house when I was growing up because they are much older than me. But um, it was a lot of us around. I had a lot of nieces. I got countless nieces and nephews, cousins. And when my nieces and nephews would come over, my friends would come over, whoever would come over, and we're hanging out. And sometimes, you know, the decibel level <laughs> would get to a point that was at my mother's threshold. And when the decibel level got at my mother's threshold, you guess what she said? She would yell out in the middle of all of us, Lord, I need some peace. She had gotten to the point where she had gotten so much external, verbal, uh, decibel, auditory stimuli that she got frustrated and just in, in an effort to get us to quiet down, she would say, Lord, I need some peace. And some of you are to that point even now. You might be yelling, Lord, I need some peace, but things are still raging around you. And and you may be in the situation that you're in with the virus and everything that's going on where all those things seem calm as it relates to social distancing and and, and movement around our neighborhoods and in our cities. And uh, there's not as many cars on the road. There, There seem like there's a peaceful atmosphere around us, but when you look at your soul, Uh, there's not a peaceful uh, disposition inside of you because whether it's because you lost your job uh, or or whether it's not just you just lost your job, you have a job, you're just not able to go to it right now. And so you're around people, you're around your family 24-7 and you don't get a break from them. You love them, but you need a break from them. So many different things in your life going on that's driving you nuts and causing you a lack of peace. Some of you, it is financial loss. Some of you, it is where you are in relation to 
I've lost out on this. I'm losing out on these opportunities. And, 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 and when I look at the bills, there's more months than there is money, and I'm frustrated. Uh, you, you, you lack peace. Some of you are having to deal with a spouse that you really haven't had to engage before. You lack peace. Some of you are having to homeschool your kids with math and all types of stuff that you don't know. You need peace. Everybody needs peace. But the question is, what is peace? Who gives it? And how do we acquire it? That, that, that's, that's the big question for us as we look at and we recognize the reality of everybody needs some peace. And how could somebody um, that's in prison, Paul in this text is in prison. My man's on lockdown. Now, you got to understand, Rikers Island had nothing on Greco-Roman prisons. I mean, you, you got Rikers Island. You, you, you know, you got in D.C., we had O.K. I mean, you got, we had Lorden. You got all kinds of spots out there. San Quentin over on the west side. Those are beast mode prisons, prison holes. But prisons back then, they didn't get three squares a meal. They didn't get time out in the sun. They, they were in dungeons, and they had no toilets. I mean, so he was in a destructive situation in the sense of being in the disease everywhere around him, yet and chained to a Roman soldier, some scholars say. But even in the midst of that, he's pinning this pericope about peace. How in the world can you pin a pericope about peace when you're not in a peaceful position? That's because God can give you peace in your, in your, in your person even though you don't have peace in your position. And so in light of that reality, I, I, I got a couple points for you, your boy out your way. Number, number, if we're going to talk about, Lord, I need some peace and we're going to get it, uh, uh, point number one, take control of your feelings. Mm, 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 mm. Somebody said, you could do that? Yes. You see in the text, you're supposed to let truth inform your feelings, not let feelings inform truth. Now, 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 the, now the text says, this is rejoice in the Lord Always. That's, that's a crazy reality. You know, person would be like, what's that mean? Act like you're happy when you're not happy? That's not what rejoice means. Rejoice, embedded in the word rejoice is the word joy. Now, in understanding the word joy as is used in the Bible, joy and happiness aren't the same thing. Happiness is about circumstances and your feelings aligning with circumstances. Joy is different. Joy is transcendent satisfaction with God no matter what. Help me today. It's transcendent satisfaction with God no matter what. So so, so in other words, in other words, when we talk about this idea of of rejoicing in the Lord always, the reality is he's telling you always not because of the good situations that you should rejoice in. He's actually telling you for the lopsided issue that you'd go through where you're frustrated, where you have to make a decision to rejoice. Now, why do you rejoice? Because sometimes difficulty can cloud joy. Joy is something that you get at salvation based on Galatians chapter 5. One of the parts of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Now, the issue is technically joy can't be taken away from you if you know God. The question isn't, is it taken away? The question is, are you using it? Now, 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 how do you use and access joy when you don't have no joy? You have some tool. Rejoicing is a tool that you utilize to bring joy out of you that's already in you, not trying to grab joy from someplace on the outside of you. In other words, joy's been put inside of you. I'm going to see if I can make it plain because y'all looking at me funny. I can tell through the screen you're looking at me funny. And so I, I was watching, you know, I, I, I got to admit, I, I have had some binge moments during, during this. And I, I've watched some weird videos on YouTube. And um, I saw these Asian cats go fishing. I'm like, oh, money going fishing? I'm like, cool. He going fishing. He goes to the water. But what ends up happening is when he is, is giving me a little feedback. Turn it down just a little bit. He, he, he went to the water. And, 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 and when he went to the water, it was interesting. He didn't go to the water that was out there. There were like these holes all on the shore. There were these holes all on the shore. And I was like, why in the world is he going to the holes and not going to the water? Dude ain't even had no fishing pole. So I'm like, what is he about to do? So money had in his hand, listen to what he had in his hand. He had a bucket, some soda, and some Mentos. I'm like, what is this dude about to do? 
he goes up to the hole and he, he squishes around in the, in the little hole. It's not in the water. It's on the sand. So he's squishing around in the water. He drops one of the mentos into the soda. It fizzes up. He pushes, he pushes the soda down into the hole. The, so, the hole is, is already got a little water in it but, it, but it starts filling up and fizzing up. And as it begins to fizz up, out jumps three fish. I'm like, I'm like, he went fishing not, listen, he went fishing with something weird, not with a fishing pole, but with some Mentos and soda. Why? Because when you put Mentos in soda, it causes a bubbling effect. And when it causes a bubbling effect, it can cause some st- the fish to jump out of there because the fish can't take it in there anymore because they're supposed to, they're supposed to breathe water. But when the soda and the Mentos go in there and cause a bubbling effect, they jump out and he's able to grab them and they're able to be fed off of it. That's what rejoicing is. Rejoicing is the decision to be joyous and to bless the Lord at all times and his praise continually be in your mouth. And as you make the decision of lifting your hands, as you make the decision of opening your mouth, there's a bubbling effect that happens on the inside of you and joy that's already on the inside of you experiences the bubbling effect and the joy jumps out and you're able to be fed in a starving situation off of joy all because you decided to rejoice in the Lord at all times. It's a decision. It's a decision. It's a decision. I know where you are is frustrating, but joy is a decision, not a feeling. Listen, <clears throat> and when you rejoice, your feelings catch up with your decision. <laughs> you have to, that's, that's how you, can, you control your emotions, you control your feelings, by telling your feelings that I'm not going to follow you. You got to tell your feelings, I'm not going to follow you into this trap. Because what the, your feelings will do is it will put you in a pity party when you got the God of heaven at your disposal. And when you got God at your disposal, there's nothing you can't do. But guess what rejoicing also do? I can spend time on this all day. Rejoicing is resisting the opportunity to grumble, argue, and complain. Why? Why? Because in chapter, guess what? In chapter 2 of Philippians, it tells you, work out your soul salvation with fear and trembling and do all things without grumbling and complaining. When you want to complain and grumble about what you don't have, You got to make the decision that you're not going to let complaining rule you. Because guess what? What what, what does, I mean, I mean, family, tell me what in the world does it ever benefit you? I'm going to come back to this in a minute. What does complaining actually ever benefit you? We're going to talk about that in in, in, in a second. But, 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 But what I like about this is the text didn't say rejoice because of what's going on. That's not what it said. It said rejoice in the Lord. (laughs) Now, why is that so important? Because rejoicing in the Lord transcends your circumstances. Now, uh, even though you're in your situation, you're more in the Lord than you're in that situation. Now, 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 I know you're looking at me funny like, what, what, like that's so abstract. How, how, how does, how does that work in motivating my now with what I'm dealing with? Real simple. One of my favorite movies in the world is Independence Day. I love that movie. And my favorite scene in that movie is when the dad was in the battle at the end and the spaceship from above was about to zap everything and blow the ground up and everything. And the dad had a thought to drive himself into the ship to make it explode. And, 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 and you could tell when he took off his thing, you know you're doing something serious when you're in the air and you take your little mask off and you just kind of sit back because you, you know you're about to die. You don't need to breathe like that no more. You, you know it's over. But guess what he did? Guess what he did, though? <clears throat> he, he, he didn't know whether he was going to do it, but he saw a picture of his kids. And when he saw a picture of his kids and he touched the picture, he looked at it and he kissed it. And it was something about, even though he was in that ship, about to die, when he saw a picture of his children, it transported him into the reason why he was living. 
And when he saw the reason why he was living, he was willing to make the decision to take the ultimate sacrifice because he rejoiced in his children, not in what he was dealing with at that particular time. Listen, you as a believer must do the same thing. You must rejoice in the Lord, thinking about the goodness of Jesus, all the things that he's done for you, your soul crying out, thinking how he took care of you, thinking about how he looked out for you, thinking about who he is. Guess what? That will transport you when you you, when you focus on him and you invest time in your mental capacity, we're going to go later into that, into him things will change. And that's the reality of us as believers. We have to begin to have a more effective disposition. He says, <coughs> he says here in the text, he says, let your graciousness be known to everyone, the Lord is near. Now, it's interesting here because graciousness is, is kind of like a, another abstract word that doesn't kind of have that kind of, <clears throat> kind of concrete engagement of the mind and heart and, and even the hands and the reality. So the idea of graciousness, this word is interesting. It, 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 it can be translated forbearing spirit or kindness or a, 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 a gentleness. In other words, it, one commentary says, it says the term gentleness or graciousness was often used to describe an attitude of kindness where a normal response would be retaliation. In other words, don't let how you feel, and I don't like this term, but I'm going to use it, be the energy you give off. You, you know, some people, they don't, they, 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 they got, I hate to use vibe, this new age language, but this will help contextual, to, uh, to help us contextual. Like you ever heard a person, they just got a negative vibe about them just all the time. You met somebody, you, it's not that just that they're quiet. They're annoyed by something that exudes from them. You know what I'm saying? Graciousness, meaning while you're in your difficulty, while you're in your quarantine, while you're in your difficult time, because Paul was quarantined, he's saying you don't have to act like what you're going through. You don't have to act, you don't always have to give everybody a piece of your crazy mind. Don't nobody want to hear all that? Some people, if we all going through something difficult, the last thing we want to hear about is meandering in the difference. That doesn't mean you don't have time to vent. Venting should be a season, not a lifestyle. Help me today. Some of y'all just, just all the time, just always, some of y'all, okay, we got to, okay, just share your heart, I'm your friend, boom. Now, let's lament. But then let's, 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 let's have some graciousness of spirit. Paul wants us to understand. Oh, we got to move. He says in verse 6, he said, don't worry about anything. <clears throat> he said, but everything in, through prayer peti and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is dope. Now, what's interesting about worry is Jesus talks to us about worry. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. He said, listen, it's enough trouble of its own. He said, so don't even enter into tomorrow's worries. That kind of is peaceful if Jesus say tomorrow got enough trouble. So if Jesus say tomorrow got enough trouble, maybe we should stay in today's troubles and deal with these Jones. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but what is worry? What is it? Let's, let's talk about the anatomy of worry. Worry is negative meditations, listen to me, that turn into being overwhelmed. It's constantly rehearsing in your mind the issues of a life without any clear God solution. That, that's, that's what worries do. Worry is constantly meditating on where the bank account is, or in many of our cases, where it's not. It, it's, it's meditating on how much you got to do that you can't get done in your own strength. It, it's, it's meditating on your kids' schoolwork that you're trying to help them work on. And you, you call it new math, and it's the same math, some of it. We just don't know how to do it. So we get overwhelmed. A to the dog on men, everybody. You understand? And you're getting overwhelmed. Worrying is like, this is what worrying is like. Let me, let me, let's, let's, let's uncover the nakedness of worry. Worry is like looking at somebody else's net worth or like counting someone else's money or having an opinion on someone else's life or complaining or daydreaming. All of those have in common, they change nothing. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Looking at somebody else's net worth on Google don't change your bank account. 
So why are you investigating what can't change your situation? So what worry does, worry is the willingness to try to absorb and do life in your own strength, in your own mind. In other words, worrying is taking on life without God as a help in the picture. And so, and so he says, he says, listen, he says, no, he said, don't worry about anything. How do you do that? He says, but everything, <coughs> he said, everything in prayer, everything, everything in prayer and petition. So he's saying everything that you're worrying about, pray about. <laughs> That's so simple. Everything you're worried about, pray about. How much, listen, there are some times where I am absolutely overwhelmed. You've been real, real overwhelmed. And you know right now, you know many of us, we go to McDonald's, but you're scared now. You ain't going to McDonald's now. Some, some of y'all eat some food. Some of y'all, are, some of y'all go to the liquor store, but the liquor store is boarded up now, ain't they? A- amen. Don't say nothing. The weed spot, you can't go to the weed spot because you're supposed to stay in the, uh, uh-oh. Some Christians say, uh-oh, right? Right. M- many of us usually, when we get overwhelmed, go to outlets, now that we're quarantined, bad outlets and some good outlets, but, <clears throat> but, but now that we're quarantined, it's kind of like a massive kind of cartery blockage that's happening in our souls. And, and we're trying to figure out what to do. Have you ever prayed about what you're worrying about? In other words, have you ever made a list and bullet pointed everything that worries you? Some of you may not even be able to make a list. You may just be able to say, you're so overwhelmed. I'll just say, it just put everything, right? And what, what I want you to do is when you make that list, I want you to take time with God and even with someone else to pray about each one of those things on a regular basis. And then it says, prayer, everything in prayer and petition with thanksgiving. That's rejoicing. How does that work with thanksgiving? I'm glad you asked. When you're in a worrying situation, you're not applying joy. You apply rejoicing in order that, guess what? Guess what? You apply rejoicing in order to experience your joy. You take that same rejoicing and joy, pray about that bullet point list that you're frustrated with, and then when you deal with all of those different things, you pray it and thank God as if it's already done because you've rejoiced in the situation that you're worrying about. God brought joy out and encouraged you to make a list. Once you make the list, then you're able to pray about it, but then thank God that it's already done as if it's already done and it's over with. And what happens is you begin to manage your emotions better because you're taking them to the Lord, not just living in your head. Many of us just live in our head. No scripture. No scripture. No, no scripture battling it. No time with the Lord. No accountability or anything. We just live within our own head. And God wants you to come out of living in your own head. Look at verse 7. It says, when this happens... <clears throat> The peace of God. What is peace of God? It means holistic well-being. In other words, here it's talking about guarding your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, which, which, it says, it's which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What does peace mean? Arene is the cousin word of the Hebrew word shalom, which means restitching things back to God's order. In other words, he wants your intellect and your emotions peaceful. What you're thinking about and how you feel, peaceful. <clears throat> now, what's dope about the text, what's dope about what the text says, is it says peace will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Is when you rejoice in the Lord, when you worry, and you have joy that comes, that bubbles up because of the rejoicing, you made the list, you're thanking God, now that peace has been set in place, it stands in front of what wants to come in your head that the devil wants to put in it. It acts as a guardian against it. But guess what? It also guards what's already in your head that you're trying to utilize as a way to be a peace party pooper. And when that happens, you have to begin. This is a cycle. This is not a one-time thing that you do. This is something that you have to constantly tell yourself and preach the gospel to yourself. That's why Christ is our peace, right? Right? Christ is our peace, and because he's our peace, we get to experience the glorious magnitude of not having to live our lives on our own. I love the way the Bible says this. Peter says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Have you, have you ever just really just, like, like most people that I know that are overwhelmed, I ask them how they talk to God, and some of them say yes, some of them say, most of them say no. 
How do you expect to survive if you ain't taking it to God? And the question is also, those who say they're taking it to God, did you really take it to him? Did you really spend time? I'm not talking about the quick, Lord, help me in this situation. In Jesus' name, amen. That's not prayer. I'm saying, well, you got to go in, God, I really feel overwhelmed. I don't know what to do about this situation. Money's funny. Resources funny. I don't know what the future. I'm supposed to graduate in a few months. I wanted to go to my prom. I'm not going to get to go to the prom. You may be in the NFL, NBA. You may be a draft pick. Man, you thought you were going to be a draft pick. We don't even know when the game's coming back. Some of you, some of you rich folk, done, you, you, some of you cats, young cats, done spent up all your bread on some drip, and now this famine hit, and now you leaned in the mug, and you're trying to go on stock X to sell something. Listen, I'm telling you right now, many of us are dealing with some stuff. And guess what? God, even in the midst of those, even in the midst of bad stewardship, even in the midst of all the different things that's happened in our life, God, is, God can redeem and help you to recover from that. Last point, it's real quick, and I'm out your way. <coughs> Feed your mind the fruits of peace. Feed your mind. Listen, <coughs> you have to be careful of your mind. Remember I said, you can't just live in your head. You got to feed it truth. You got to feed it truth. Look what the text says. It's real simple. <coughs> it's very, very simple. It says, finally, brethren, brothers and sisters. I'm used to the other translation I used to use. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. What is truth or true, consistent with what God says, honorable, worthy of respect, just, morally right, pure, that has to do with holiness and characteristics of moral and ritual purity, lovely, pleasing, commendable, that means praiseworthy or admirable, uh, um, moral excellence, um, that which is a reflection of godly standards, praiseworthy, something that can have high commendation. Listen to that list of things you can put in yourself to begin to invest truth in. You know what I, I, you, you have to do? The Bible says dwell on these things. I like that. It, it wants you to dwell on truthful things, honorable things, just things, pure things, lovely things, commendable things, more excellent things and praiseworthy things. No, 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 what I had to do. I couldn't, you know, I, I'm a type of dude. I like to watch them shows, them, them, them shows that show, uh, you know, uh, somebody got killed and they're trying to find the murderer and all of that and who did it. You, sometimes you can, you got, sometimes you got to defeed yourself. You got to starve yourself for some stuff that don't uplift. Some of you listen to stuff and do something. I'm not trying to police whether you listen to secular music or not. All I'm saying is, Whatever you're feeding yourself, the question is, does it help you, particularly in the situation that you're in now, to have truth, honor, just, uh, be just, pure, lovely, commendable, praiseworthy, and morally excellent? You need to be feeding yourself stuff like that. And he says, dwell on these things. In other words, dwell means to keep a mental record of it. And that's what you need to be filling your mind with. If you're going to walk in the peace of God if you're going to walk in the peace of God, that's what's going to happen. He says, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. Listen, and the God of peace will be with you. I'm going to close here. Um, I love boxing. I'm a boxing buff. Love boxing. I, 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 I love the sweet science. I, I not only love the knockout artists, I even like those who have the ability to just have impeccable defense and the ability to do And one of my favorite boxers in that, in that regard is Floyd Mayweather. Now, <clears throat> whether you think his fights are boring, you, if you're watching his fight and you understand what's going on in the ring, from the science of boxing standpoint, it's mesmerizing to see what happens. But it's interesting that he didn't get that way overnight. One of the things that <clears throat> somebody asked him, have you ever thought about losing? He said, nah. He said, he said one of the things that I fight to do as I'm always keeping winning in my mind. He said, as long as I keep winning in my mind, he said, I actually picture myself winning. All the way through, he says, because it, in picturing myself winning, it puts me in a mindset to remember my training. And when I'm able to remember my training, if I'm thinking about losing, I, I begin to fall out of the pocket. But, but, but thinking of losing myself, but when I think about winning, then I have a picture of, of, of the work that was put in in order to put me here, then guess what I do? I'm able uh, to move forward and win. Well, Christ died on the cross for you. And because Christ died on the cross for you, he did the training work 
that was on your behalf to give you the necessary strength. This is banging. To, to give you the grace. <clears throat> to, you, you don't have to think about winning. Christ has already won for you. And because Christ has already won for you, you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. So my encouragement to you today, Lord, I need some peace. Let me encourage you with this. Because Christ died for you, family, guess what? You already got peace. Father, we thank you <laughs> for your work in our lives. Thank you that we are not trying to get peace, but peace is already ours. God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ for people that are dealing with wrestling with being anxious and worrying about everything that's going on. God, I pray that you would do a work in their lives to break that spirit of worry that's over them and help them to practice these grace-reaching principles. These are means of grace that help us to experience what you've already given us through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're listening today and you don't know Christ as Savior. <clears throat> Listen, all of us, God, had a contract out on our life. All of us deserve to be eternally separated from God. But in Jesus Christ, God has taken us from spiritual disconnection to spiritual connection. Let me say it again. Spiritual disconnection to spiritual connection. Only way that happens, though, is if you trust Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. You got to trust what he did on the cross, dying and getting up from the grave. And he'll be your peace. He won't just give you peace. He will be peace for you. Peace is tranquility in the midst of conflict. And the greatest conflict for, for, for humanity is not what we're going through with this virus, COVID-19, coronavirus, no. <laughs> the greatest thing on us is our sin and the wrath that is to come. But the beauty of knowing Jesus Christ is God passes over because he sees Christ's blood covering you. If you trust in him today, you can go from spiritual disconnection spiritual connection. Father, touch that person that put their confidence in Jesus Christ. Now help us to follow up with them and connect with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Email us at admin at epiphanyfellowship.org if you have trusted Christ or if you're in the comments, fill, put, your, put your information in there, email or something. One of our team is going to, one of our, our team, our urban missionary team is going to connect with you and help you with the ability to walk from uh, spiritual disconnection to spiritual connection. And our hope is to begin to disciple you so you can go for spiritual infancy, spiritual maturity. Thank you for 